Hello and welcome back to the Freelancers. Thanks for coming back to the channel. Thanks for everyone that tuned in to the live stream last week to the kickoff of season six. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to link it up here because it seems like it hasn't really been published to the people. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the latest trends, the latest research in the translation field. I try to keep up as much as possible with it. It's impossible to, you know, read all the studies. And I mean, we are not researchers. We, this is not part of our paid daily work, right? But I try to be at least with the with the research that comes out that's linked to technology. I try to keep up to date, to read, uh, like I have some RSS, RSS feeds, I think, or R, I don't know. I never know what it's called. This one here, I have it set up for, for some uh, keywords. And uh, so I get uh, into my inbox regularly, the latest uh, research that is published on, on uh, journals like Target, like Multilingual, uh, on the Springer publication website. So uh, yeah, I don't read everything, but I just thought I will compile the three most relevant ones I read this year, or let's say this summer, because um, early this year I haven't really read anything about it, but lately I've gotten more and more into it again. So I compiled three research papers that I found interesting through the abstract. And when I find the abstract interesting, I go, I go ahead and read the whole article. So I thought I'd just summarize it a bit. I'm not going to spoil the whole thing, so you can also go ahead and read it. But just to pique a bit your interest uh, in the top three most relevant articles I read that came out in 2024 and 2025. Okay, so let's get into it with the first one. I have my laptop here with my notes. I'm gonna always peek down a bit, uh, but I'm also gonna show you the, the publication on screen. So the first one is called The Link Between Translation Difficulty and the Quality of Machine Translation, a Literature Review and Empirical Investigation. This was published in 2024 uh, by Sahar Aragi and Alphonse Palang Karaya. Sorry if I mispronounced that. And uh, the, the abstract was so interesting. It was a really cool, um, lead up you know and it made me uh, really want to investigate this a bit further so in essence uh, if you could like summarize the hook in like a popular science sentence it would be uh, have you ever wondered why certain sentences come out flawlessly in, in machine translations and why certain sentences are really the, the tool is really struggling with it right this is not only relevant for the clients but it's also relevant for us because the one sentences or the reasons why they are struggling is where we can excel so i really was interested to see what the, what the study found so the the core idea the core hypothesis was that aragi and palankaraya wanted to study um, how the difficulty of the source text affect the quality of the target texts and then eventually with this insight, they wanted to see whether they can predict which sentences will be good and which MT will fail in, you know, so to have like a safe uh, um, kind of framework to give to the client saying when to use MT and when not to. This also gives us the ability to scope the, the source text better, right? Sometimes you get the source text by a client and it's maybe very long and you don't really have the time to go through it and send the proper quote. Uh, but if you have this insight, you know exactly what to look for. And like, if you want to quote a uh, machine translation, human translation hybrid, for example, you can exactly guess or you can exactly guess is a weird sentence. That doesn't make sense. You can estimate uh, which parts of the text will take longer, will take more manual post editing, etc., which will be more flawlessly translated. Um, the findings were, were quite interesting, but then in the end also a bit, I guess exactly what I, what I thought would happen, what I predicted. So they found that longer, more complex sentences usually get worse MT scores. Uh, ambiguous words confuse the system. So especially if the context is limited. So if you have break, for example, break can mean so many things, right? So if you have uh, short segments that have the word break in it, uh, it's very tough for a, for a machine translation system to guess the context correctly. Uh, if you have the past, if you say broke, then the context is already more limited. You still have broke as in breaking something uh, in two, and you have broke as in no money, right? You still have two um, meanings, but with break, you even have much more, right? You also have the break as a noun, you have uh, taking a break, or you have break up, you have uh, break off something so it's uh, break is a typical word that uh, is tough for MT to, uh, for, for AI to uh, to find its way through the ambigu ambiguity so in the end the prediction model that they came out with was not perfect but it was reliable enough to flag high risk sentences so if the, if there was really a lot of ambiguity a lot of 
uh, verbs, you know, ellipses within a sentence when it was very complex, the empty score was significantly worse. So in that sense, you can say that there is a correlation as long as the source, uh, as soon as the source text difficulty goes up, the empty quality goes down. All right, next one. Uh, if I mispronounce the previous names, then I'm gonna definitely do it this time too. Uh, this article was published by Zheng Jian Li and Lang Chen. Uh, it's called Mind vs. Machine, Comparative Analysis of Metaphor-Related Word Translation by Human and AI Systems. I really like this title because metaphors are always a tricky thing for, for tools, for machines. Um, and I, I love to see uh, um, like specific research done on this topic, even though it's super uh, niche, of course, but for me this stuff is very interesting. Um, 18 pages, that was actually one that was tough to get through because it's very technical. Uh, I can maybe show you a couple of graphs. Like the first, yeah, you, you can see like it really goes into the the models of the, the flowchart of the phrases, how they get parsed by the MT, which system, statistical, neural, uh, which translation st uh, strategy is used. So it was very cool. I learned a lot. Uh, if you are interested in translation theories as well, while also interested in metaphors, literally technical, it has everything. So it's a very cool study. In essence, what they try to figure out is whether AI thinks the same as humans do when it comes to to figurative speech, to metaphors, you know. Uh, how does the system figure out how to do the metaphor? How does the human figure out to do it? Is it the same links? What's behind it? So what Lee and Chen did was basically compared comparing human translations, uh, machine translations, NMT, and AI systems, as in LLMs, uh, how they translate very metaphor-rich texts, which are better, uh, which can keep up with the humans, um, what are the outputs looking like, just, you know, a comparative analysis. The three metrics that were used was whether the metaphor was preserved, whether, what is, whether it was adapted creatively, or whether it was lost entirely. And the findings were interesting. Uh, LLMs, AI tools, were actually able to keep up with humans much better than NMTs, than machine translation. That was quite kind of surprising to me because NMTs are, after all, modeled exactly for that purpose, right? And uh, it's interesting to see that LLMs in this in this literary sense, in this metaphor figurative sense, were outperforming N NMT machines uh, significantly. Um, the machines really struggled with novel metaphors and culturally embedded metaphors. Uh, the human was came out on top in in uh, in all metrics, but LLMs were able to mimic human strategies better than classic NMTs. And the last article that I uh, read with a lot of anticipation because I actually know uh, Anna that is part of this. So this was published by uh, Kio Geritz and Anna Gerberov Arenas. And the title is To Empty or Not To Empty, an eye-tracking study on the reception by Dutch readers of different translation and creativity fields. Uh, really interesting, a bit confusing the title, but that, well, basically what they did is uh, they made eight Dutch readers, I think it was eight, don't quote me on that, uh, Dutch readers read different texts that were either uh, machine translated, post-edited, um, translated by a person, or uh, the original source text. What they then did is uh, identify so-called UCPs, uh, Units of Creative Potential. Uh, these are a bit more like difficult things to read, a bit more, you know, they, they require also a lot of uh, effort by the translator because they are hard to translate. So in the, in the reading flow, there are maybe things that you have to reread again to just understand what is actually said. So metaphors, culturally nuanced expressions, stylistic choices, etc. These are UCPs. What then happened is after the, the Dutch speakers read either, either one of these texts, they had a creative think aloud and they were discussing uh, about their findings, how they found the, the reading, and they found that um, creative UCPs are actually increasing the cognitive load of readers. What that means is that creativity matters and readers feel it, right? Uh, the highest cognitive load was, was needed by people reading the human translation texts and the lowest was needed by people reading the machine translation texts. So that means it's it's not a bad thing to have more cognitive load, right? That actually uh, strengthened the immersion of the reader. So they really feel it like if they read it, they, they want to feel challenged. They want to feel the creativity. And that was so nice to, to read for me. 
Uh, it also shows me that MT might be easier on the eyes because they used eye tracking. I didn't even mention that. They used eye tracking model to, to see how the reader was reading the text, if they had to go back, if they had to fly around with the eyes to find the reference, etc. So with MT systems, they found a more fluid uh, transition through the text. So it's easier on the eyes, easier to read, but much less cognitive load. So less engagement, less immersion. immersion. Maybe you read the text through and you read it, but it's not really in your brain. You don't really think about it. So what that means for us freelancers is we can, we can or translators, we can sell that unique selling point that uh, that creativity matters, right? It's it's uh, human crafted creativity is is not, it's not just. Uh, I mean, it it adds value. It adds premium. It adds deluxe to a to a translation. Uh, it's it's emotionally, it's cognitively stimulating the the reader. Uh, it makes the text much more rich. Um, yeah, it's, it's proven in this study that the readers enjoy it much more. So while it's true that MT is of course faster and it makes the text more just standardized, more, you know, uh, nice through the middle on the 50%, with a human touch, you can go a bit up, a bit down, you can trigger emotions, you can make readers linger in certain spots that are important in a text. So you can really give it a body, a characteristic, an emotion. There you go. These were all uh, studies that I really enjoyed. Thanks to all the researchers that put out this stuff uh, on a regular basis. There is so much translation studies done out there. And for me, it's just nice to see that, you know, sometimes you're a bit in a bubble in your own little desk and just working on texts every day. So it's it's nice to me to see that there is a engaged uh, translation researcher community in the Netherlands, in Germany, in China, everywhere in the world that is trying to um, highlight the importance of this profession, the, the, the small nuances that lead to a good text versus a medium text. Nowadays, the trend seems to be that just mediocre texts are enough in most use cases, which is fine. I understand why, like it's fast, it's efficient, uh, but that's exactly where we can stand out in, in the other 25% of the cases, right? Where, where, where nuance matters, where texts matter, um, where creativity matters, where people need to be engaged by words. And that is uh, exactly what we do every day. So thanks for watching. I hope this was interesting to do a bit more uh, uh, a theoretical video, but I will be back with more uh, regular programming again next week. Take care. I see you then. Bye bye.